What I want to do today is expand on some of the material we covered on Robert Hooke, because it turns out, at least maybe this is my own personal hang up, but it seems to me Robert Hooke has been an important figure in the development of uh, science in the end of the 17th century. And his recognition is only slowly starting to emerge. So as one looks through many of the websites, a lot of the material is, is relatively old and you'll see that it's colored by a certain kind of bias against him. Here's a, an example that comes out of a Wikipedia page that's pretty good. And this one happens to be biased actually for Hook rather than opposed to him. Um, so it tends to be very positive in a lot of things and it leaves out quite a bit of information. So it's, it's a sort of a, a challenge itself, but he quotes or whoever writes this quotes that Hook has been described as been sort of quite grumpy, despicable, melancholy, mistrustful, jealous. It goes on to say he was unscrupulous, possessed of a vanity of sorts. He was cantankerous, caustic. I think a lot of this arose because of Hook's position, which I'll get to in a second. The other way of looking at this is that it's only been in the 20th century initially, and then even more towards the beginning of this century, that other information about Hook has actually started to emerge. So there was a, his diaries were finally published in 1935. And I've read some of them and it's fascinating because what he talks about mostly in the diaries is going out for not coffee, but for chocolate in various coffee houses and with whom, who he will be meeting in these various coffee houses and what they're going to talk about. And I may get to a little bit of it later on, although probably not as much, but he actually was an extremely busy person for a great deal of his life because he had the combination of the job in which he was working for the Royal Society as their curator, as their chief sort of vetter of experiments, if you will, and at the same time, uh, starting to operate as the surveyor for the city of London and getting involved in construction and laying out of the, the maps after the fire. So he was quite, quite a busy man. And it's not clear where all of the problems arose. Now, there were some issues that came up that were very clear and did create real problems, both between Hook and other people. So let me mention a couple to begin with. As I mentioned, I think in the last lecture, Hook had been particularly interested in this whole idea of how of clocks and how clocks worked. He was investigating pendulum clocks for quite a while. And then it turned out that Christian Huygens, whose name you see down here, um, Christian Huygens had actually first published his work on a pendulum clock that was very impressive and which he proposed to use for this issue of measuring position on the seas as a longitude. And of course, Hook and lots of others realized that you can't use a pendulum that swings back and forth as, as a way of judging your time when you're on the ship because the ship does as much swinging back and forth as a pendulum might, and everything gets thrown off. So Hook apparently developed the idea of making a spring instead of a pendulum that would swing back and forth. What he had in mind was a spring like this, that would contract and open. And the background for this is that in the 
1650s, the late 1650s, maybe a little bit later, Hooke developed quite a, an expertise on springs, published some papers on it, and in fact now is known for the, as being the author of what is called Hooke's Law of Springs, which is basically the more you stretch it, the stronger the string, spring's effort to return will be. So by building on this effort on springs, and there, he published work much later on this, he realized that you could probably have some kind of spinning device. So something here that would tie into the spring and would pull it closed and then open again, return it. So it would act like a pendulum in the sense that it would go back and forth. And his idea was that he could turn this thing into a watch. Now, the problem with this is that he discussed this issue pretty early on in his career with Boyle and, and others. And the claim is that he attempted to patent it, but realized that, or ran into trouble, which is that he couldn't get enough support for the idea of doing it, and certainly to make enough money out of this. And you have to remember that Robert Hooke came from a relatively limited background and money became a very important issue for him. So Hooke claimed maybe he did this thing around 1670 or so. And Christian Huggins published his own design by sending a letter to the Royal Society in 1675, in which he described this idea of a pocket watch with springs in it. So Hooke became aware of it and became quite upset, apparently, from what one can tell, and claimed, no, that he himself had produced such a watch and showed it to the Royal Society five years earlier. The problem is there was no record. And there's now a study that has come out. It had come out drips and drabs over the past couple of years, but it's finally clear now that what happened was that, I'll give it to you in two ways, that the records of this presentation for the Royal Society were apparently lost. And they were lost in an interesting way just for that period of time. These were papers that were being run or cared for by Oldenburg. As you may recall, he was the man who was the center of, who was for many years the secretary of the Royal Society and who maintained all sorts of connections one way or another. And there's a story around that, in fact, Oldenburg became aware not only of Hooke's interest in this and saw Hooke's presentation, but he also conveyed this material to Huggins through his connections in, with Holland. And there's some sort of suggestion, at least, that Huggins got the idea for this clock or got the final results for it from talking to Oldenburg. And at the same time, Oldenburg seemed to have hidden the papers on this thing. Well, part of the story then is that Hooke apparently started looking through the data. He became secretary of the Royal Society and started looking through the files to see if there was a record of this material and couldn't find it. There was a great deal of concern about it. And certainly as others looked through the files of the Royal Society, there was no evidence of it. Then somewhere around 2006 or so, a file, a box of papers was discovered. This is really a, almost like a joke. A box of papers was discovered in a farmhouse somewhere in England. And it turns out that collection of papers was Hooke's diaries and the records from the Royal Society that were missing from that time. And they were only discovered, as I said, very late, 
there was a possibility that that whole collection was going to be auctioned off and disappeared. And it turns out that the Royal Society found out about these papers early enough that they were able to obtain them so that it's now possible to have the records of the Royal Society from that period that where the papers seem to disappear. And interestingly enough, among them, Hook himself had kept one of the pages from the Royal Society documents that specifically said, quote, Robert Hook demonstrated a watch and it was, it was dated 1670. So it took about 300 years or more before the vindication of this claim that Hook had that he had found made a watch at the same time and that maybe the ideas came through Huggins and this suggestion that perhaps Oldenburg was involved in transmitting the information across. So it's a very interesting bit of scientific jealousy, but it also leads to the question that we may wanna be wrestling with as we go along, which is what becomes significant is when thinks about history moving forward. And we'll see this showing up again as we keep going today. That is, is it the ones that get the things done, the ones that have the ideas, the ones that get the reporting done properly, who are the most sort of consequential? It fits into this old statement, which you may have all heard, that history is written by the victors. You always hear by the successful ones of what the history was. And I thought what I would do is at least show you in this picture over here, what a balanced spring actually looks like, even in a contemporary watch. If you have a non-crystal formed watch, if you have a relatively standard old fashioned watch with a balanced spring in it, this would be a watch that ticks, goes tick tock, right? If you hold it up, Rolexes work that way as it turns out. The, the modern clocks that we use generally all have uh, solid state crystals in them that keep the time much better than, than these springs. But they're still around and you can actually see quite a bit of information about them. So this is an example of a story in which Hook's objections were in some way dismissed because one couldn't find the information. And then it turned out Hook himself had kept the information because he was somewhat skeptical and concerned about Oldenburg's sort of what he called nefarious uh, plans to take the power away from Hook. So Hook was in general, a man who was obsessed with getting proper cr uh, credit for what he was doing. So let's take another example here and talk about gravitation and the laws of motion. This is really kind of extraordinary. If one takes the look, takes the time to read through the preface and the introductions to uh, microscope, Micrographia, the book that I talked about last time, you'll discover he has all kinds of essays on speculations on different sorts of things that he has sent. So he wrote, in Micrographia, the idea that there is such a thing that all heavenly bodies, especially, are the source of their own gravitation and that they retract each other, they attract each other, and that the motion that these things have is that they'll move in a straight line unless deflected by, by some other force, causing them to describe a circle, an ellipse, or other things. And he says that this attraction is much greater as the bodies are nearer and that they decrease. He has some estimate of how much. The, the final term for that is the inverse square of the distance, but he, he didn't put it in quite to that point. Starting in 1679, he started writing 
to Newton. There was a long set of conversations about Isaac Newton, who was at that point just getting started. Newton was clearly recognized as an extremely smart, very interesting guy who was developing mathematical tools that in fact, Hooke had no access to. Hooke never really mastered the kind of mathematics that was necessary for this stuff. But he started writing to Newton and the letters appear relatively simple, straightforward. And they got more and more detailed because they started with apparently an effort from the Royal, the Royal Society to discover more about what people were doing. And as he wrote to Newton, he started raising questions with Newton and bringing up some of these issues such as the idea of gravity and the way objects might attract each other and whether this could be used as a way of understanding planetary motion. And it turned out that indeed, Newton, who finally put all this stuff together into a, a book, it took a long time for the book to come out, Principia. Um, and in fact, Newton had to be encouraged in publishing this by Edmund Halley, who we haven't really discussed at all. This is the Halley of Halley's Comet. There, there were lots of things going on at the same time. But when Newton published this, Hooke became aware of it and again pointed out, hey, you know, there's an awful lot of stuff in here that I suggested to you. Where's my credit? And apparently, because Newton himself was a pretty strong self-promoter, he minimized the effect of what Hooke had contributed. It was not clear how much he actually took from Hooke's ideas and how much not, but it started them in a certain kind of conflict about who was going to be uh, responsible, cre giving credit for the development of these ideas themselves. And once again, Hooke's ideas were sort of vague in a certain way. They were not specific enough to match the sort of thing that Newton was doing. So then we talk about light. And light turns out to be a really complicated issue. But there were two issues that came up. One of them is, what is the nature of light? Those of you who've all taken physics in some way or other, and you know something about that debate. But the questions were, how could you decide, given the limited amount of information available in the 17th century, what light was? And it's sort of interesting in that it may be that you have to go back to the sort of the mental states of the people who are doing this, even though right, they were following this grand idea of you must do experiments in order to see the results, in order to confirm your ideas. But the ideas themselves seem to be coming out of the gestalt of that time, the period, the general ideas of those ideas. And so we're gonna talk first about waves or particles, then we'll come back and talk some more about color because color turns out to be really the more important issue in terms of practical solutions. Let me start by suggesting this idea of refraction as one of the things that people understood was going on. And refraction was the sense that if a beam of light enters some sort of object of different transmission, its path changes. So it starts going this way, but in fact, it ends up going at a slightly different position. And here are two examples of ways of thinking about how this happens, okay? One idea is that light is actually a stream of particles, that when the particles hit this object in which they are going to change their path, they're their speed changes in some way as they go through, they go slower. And the ones that enter 
later. So if you have a wide beam like this, the ones that enter later are going to do that later on compared to the others. And the end result is that these are going to end up with a kind of a head start in getting through. And that will mean that they're going to exit earlier and that the end result is that the path would be shifted. The other idea has to do with waves. And if it were waves, well, maybe not so clear as to what happens when waves enter a particle like this, a change like this, how the, how the waves themselves could change. But you could argue that if, if you draw waves as, let's say we draw them as parallel lines, that is the peaks of the waves, that when the one edge of the wave enters at this end, it slows down more than the other end of the wave. And so that causes it to turn. Newton had the idea that the nature of light was in fact that it was particles. And we'll get a little bit to the question about why he, how strongly he felt about that in a moment. On the other hand, hook, And later on, Huggins, who joined Hooke in this analysis, felt that, it, that light had the properties of waves. So where do these ideas come from? Well, although I haven't been able to find this as a definite statement, maybe I just haven't read enough places, you may remember that I told you that at the very beginning of the course, I mentioned that part of the world's view of what matter consisted of was coming from Descartes, who had basically implied that everything was composed of particulate material. And so it was just a matter of getting the particles small enough to, for them to be the properties of everything for them to take care of everything. And I believe, I would think it's a fair thing to say that Newton's perspective on what light was very much based on that kind of gestalt that light was also an expression of the particulate nature of the world. At the same time, Hooke was explicit in what he had to say which was that he said he'd been watching water and he saw the waves in water. And he thought that the propagation of waves was something that could be done as a wave, as light, that light itself could also be in some way a wave function. And that then he could use the idea of the way waves work to explain things like refraction. One of the criteria then and in fact, it was sort of interesting that both Hooke and Newton used this as an, as an example of why the, their own belief would work, was this. The idea was that there's a phenomenon now that we'll call diffraction. Diffraction is different from refraction. Diffraction is the behavior of light at an edge. So here's an edge over here. And the question is, what happens to light when it goes past an edge? And the argument is this, if light were particles going past an edge like this, that even as you have more and more of them, and even if they're a little random, they're still going to show an absolute shadow that will be blocked off by, the, by this obstacle. They're not going to go around the corner. And yet, if it were waves, the interesting phenomenon is that waves will go around the corner. 
and they all explain to you why they go around the corner in another moment, okay? But that was the criterion, and they both accepted this idea as an experiment, as, as the sort of experiment that they would try to, uh, to carry out to prove whether or not you had waves or you had particles going through. And basically, Newton claimed he's never seen a sort of a fuzzy shadow, that if you have some door or some object like this, um, and you have a light bulb or some source of light, and you have an edge, that the light would only go this far and there would be no shadows, no light inside the shadow. But you don't see them because the waves of light, as it turns out, are extremely small. And because they are so small, you can't see the, refraction, the diffraction effect. Diffraction seems to arise primarily from edges that are close enough to the wavelength of the light itself. So you get an interesting phenomenon. Newton was right. In his world, he had never seen a shadow that crept across the boundary. Now, Hooke claims that he had set up an experiment just to show this. He had set up an experiment in which he used a, a lens to focus the light on, the, on a very sharp edge. And then he was hoping to see the shadow shifted somewhat. As it turns out, he was defeated by the weather in England. There were no artificial lights, right? There were candles, there were flames, and there was sunlight. And when Hook set this thing up, apparently, there was a cloudy day, he couldn't get anywhere with it. So this remained at the a point of debate for quite a while. On the other hand, Huygens came up with a model that would explain why you would get diffraction and for that matter, refraction through these kinds of samples. And what his argument was, he, had a, he developed it as a theory, which is that, remember there are several ways of writing a wave. One is to think of a wave as something like this. But maybe the way to think about these waves is not from the side, but from the top. And let's look at a wave as having a series of peaks, which is what these are. Now, what Huygens pro proposed was that, in fact, Every spot along a wave, along, let's say, along the peak of a wave, is actually the source of additional waves of the same frequency. So you end up with something like this. Okay. And so now what you can do is explain something more about what happens when you have waves of light that go, and I'll skip the refraction part, we'll just go directly to diffraction. So you now have some sort of barrier like this. And the idea would be, well, when you start by having waves that are going in this sort of way, right? And then these waves will continue on past the barrier, unchanged essentially, except for my drawing skills. But the light that hits this edge, the wave that hits this edge becomes the source of additional waves of light. Now, this is a great oversimplification, but you can see that what's happening now is that this bit of light 
has the potential to move in this direction. And so what you would get from a, instead of a defined shadow, which is what you would get from the particle model. So this would all be black. What you would get from this kind of thing is mostly dark area, but the edge would be a little fuzzier. This debate continued on, I have to say, again, through another 200 years or more. In general, the assumption was from the power that Newton had as an authority, the sense for really at least 100 years, if not more, was that light was in fact particulate even though there was evidence of this sort starting to show up, that light had wave-like particles. But the power of his authority was such that the model that most people had for light was as particles. It's kind of a remarkable story. Again, the power of authority rather than the, the power of true experimental results. Although you can see that this sort of thing, you really needed some way of getting a very fine amplification of this result. And this is why Hooke's experiment of using a, a lens to magnify the effect of the shadow would have been very helpful, but didn't seem to be too successful. So then we get into the issue of color. And here again, we have a kind of an interesting issue. That's kind of very interesting issue, which is where do colors come from? How does white light or sunlight give rise to the colors? Well, you all know, but at the end of the 17th century, no one did know. There was no good, clear answer as to where the colors came until, as it turns out, Newton carried out the experiment, which I'll show you in, a, in another minute. But what happened, once again, it's a matter of history. If you go back to Micrographia, to Hooke's book, in Micrographia, um, Hooke discusses something he calls Muscovy glass. Muscovy glass we now know as mica. And mica is a, is a, it's a stone, it's a kind of a mineral in which there are very, very fine layers of material, one on top of another. So in a sense, mica looks like sort of this sort of thing. It's got a, it might be called a crystal structure. It's got this very closely layered structure. And he talks about this and points out that if you press on it, if you press on the mica at certain areas where it's sort of already coming apart, you actually see many colors coming out. And this image that I have over here is some version of that material. It's not from mica, but it's, it's an equivalent thing. And it's what we now know as, interestingly enough, Newton's rings. But in fact, they were very clearly discussed by Hooke much earlier. And right now, if you're, you know, in taking physics courses or if you're studying this in physics, what's known is that the way you see Newton rings is you start with one piece of glass flat and another piece of glass somewhat conve concave, 
or convex pressed against it. And when these things are, these distances are close, this is the kind of pattern that you get of colors that come out. We may talk later on about where those colors come from when we talk about the uh, Young's experiments and the beginnings of the 19th century. So we'll, we'll hold that stuff apart for the moment because it involves understanding the phenomenon of interference, which nobody in the uh, 17th century really had a good sense of. But the reason that this whole thing matters was this phenomenon of chromatic aberration. As one focuses a lens that is sort of a simple basic glass lens through an object, and what's being done here is the object is the is a condenser lens in the microscope. Most of you have seen this sort of thing, where as you focus the microscope, as you focus the condenser, first of all, it gets to be sharper and sharper, and then eventually you see it as a small disk. But you notice when it's out of focus here, you see it in this case as a sort of a reddish yellow circle. If I continue to focus through, Now what I get is that same circle is blue, okay? And the reason for this is that the focal length for the different light, so I'll show it to you if, if you will. I, I hate to draw optics diagrams, but I think we need to in this case, okay? The idea is that if I start, and this is gonna be a very simple-minded, picture, and I focus the image of a, an arrow, and assume this arrow is white for the moment. Normally, what I would expect to see is an image of the arrow here in space, okay? But as it turns out, for most glass lenses, the ability to refract the light changes with the wavelength of light. We'll get to the wavelengths in another minute. But the idea is that some of the red containing light is focused in one position and the blue light is focused in another position. And so what I'm seeing in this pair of images is looking at either the blue edge, which is the one down here, or the red edge, which is the one up here. And if I have these things close together, so I move this down over here a little bit, and then I take this one and I move this one over this way a little bit. Got to move the arrowheads. And now look at this object. What I'm going to see is an object that is the combination of the blue and the red at once. In other words, it will be a very confused image. And it will be this whole process is referred to then as chromatic aberration. Okay. So why does this matter? Well, if you're an astronomer and you're looking at stars and trying to understand something about the size of the stars, or if you're looking at planets and you want to know something about what the edges of the planets look like, when you use simple telescope systems or even a, a telescope with let's say the classic Galilean telescope, which has two lenses in it, each one of those lenses has chromatic aberrations. And what you see is this sort of smear of color around everything that you're looking at. 
And this was known as a major problem in, in, in telescopes and microscopes. Turns out to be one in microscopes as well. In fact, Newton reported and said, there was no way you could correct for this with glass. That a glass lens could not correct chromatic aberration. And what he ended up doing is cheating with telescopes. And what he said was instead of trying to put your sample, your image through a lens like this, in which it was clear you were going to get both blue images and red images and everything sort of mixed together. What he did instead was he said, we'll move to what we'll call a reflecting telescope. And now the light that enters the telescope doesn't have to go through a lens. It hits the edge and then is reflected back. To a central point here. And then depending on the type of, of the, the design for the telescope, you put a mirror or something like this and you look in from the side at the image on the mirror and you don't have chromatic aberration or you have much less chromatic aberration. There are a couple of designs for this. This is the classic one that, that Newton used. Hooke actually developed another one called a, what is now called a Gregorian telescope in which you make a little hole in the back and you run some kind of tube up this way so that it looks to you as if you're still looking through a telescope, right? You hold this thing up to your eye or look through it and you can still make that work to get an image. But in either case, the idea was that you might be able to control chromatic aberration by eliminating the lens. That's a kind of a clever solution was the one that, that Newton used eventually. But then Newton carried out an extraordinary experiment. The question was, where does all this color come from? Hooke said, the waves were in some way traveling at different speeds. And if you will, bunching up to cause colors, okay? And his idea would then be as an experiment, if you could take colors that you could isolate and treat them in appropriate ways, you could get them to become white light again, okay? So his idea would be colors could form white light. As we all know, that now we know that that's not true. And once again, Hooke attempted to do this experiment, but apparently was defeated by, again, the weather in, in London. Was, he couldn't get enough bright material to do this. On the other hand, Newton had a very different point of view. And his idea, Newton who believed, who set up that the colors were separate within the white light. And once isolated, could not be brought back together to form the 
And so this led to a real this experiment that he was able to do. And let me show you now that experiment, which is really remarkable as a definitive experiment. It's a wonderful example of it. This is not the result, not a real result, is the a diagrammatic one, but it's the same thing. So here's the idea. Let's start by removing one of these prisms out of the way. You start with white light. It's given a little bit of color because, well, I can't show white on the background like this, okay? So they've decided to give it a slight tinge. And so you can see the color, the band of light that enters the prism. Once it enters the prism, uh, this is a sort of an interesting argument, uh, diagram, but it, it works, I think. It is separated into the different wavelength, the different colors that you see. Okay. And so you can take, for instance, this prism and show that if you now take this prism and just isolate the red light, you get a beam of red light through it. If you move this thing down a little more so you can pick up other wavelengths, you then start to see the others. If you pick up all the wavelengths that are now, you notice in here in different colors, bring them back together again, you get white light again. So the idea is that these separate colors are all floating in space, if you will, part of the original bit of light. Newton still believed that these were particles moving in some way that carried different color in them, okay? So that's the basis of that experiment. And it's kind of interesting because somewhere Newton apparently wrote a note to Hooke later on in their correspondence that he might be able to accommodate the wave theory of light if you made the assumption that different frequencies of waves corresponded to different color. And that's of course what we now think is that the different wavelengths of light correspond to different colors of the light itself. So it's sort of interesting that Hooke never picked up on that letter, on that suggestion from Newton himself that would accommodate the wave theory of light. So what ended up happening, and this is, this is the part that everybody talks about that's really sort of unpleasant, is that Newton, who turned out to be even more prickly and more sensitive to criticism than Hooke was, because Hooke really had done so much, he spent a lot of his time, Hooke did, of claiming that a lot of what other people had seen were things he was already quite familiar with and had reported on, but he had never put it into the final form that some of the others had. So it created a problem for Hook in which he was constantly saying, well, I, I, did, I did showed that, I did that years ago. And what he wanted was somebody to acknowledge that he had done it. And had a lot of trouble as a result of that. Newton, for instance, had a, a sort of a grudging response to, to Hooke's comments about the, uh, the gravitational structure, but Newton was working on a book which eventually was published called Optics that was published at the end, towards the sort of the end of both of their lives. It was published after Hooke died. And it was very clear that what Newton did was he took out all references to Hooke from that book. Apparently at one point, Hooke had seen some of the early ones and pointed out these are things that we really ought to be including in the way you analyze this. But Newton waited until Hooke died and then published optics with, and removed all the references to Hooke. So Hooke became a kind of a non-person, which is persisted for quite a while 
until the rediscovery both of his diaries and the rest of the diaries from the Royal Society. It's a, a really sort of unpleasant story about the history of science, but there it goes. So how do we think about this now? It's a tricky thing, right? I mean, we have, we have this situation in which Hook had a kind of an internal, almost intuitive understanding of a great deal of the structures of, uh, of material and the structures of the world. He was willing to challenge the orthodoxy, the orthodoxy which was that everything was particles. And he was willing to do experiments to try to show it. Remember the, the monument, one of the purposes that he wanted to use the monument for was to show that gravity could also be used to generate a circular motion. That turns out not necessarily to be true, but what he wanted to do was be able to drop weights from that enormous height, not affected by wind currents or air currents of other sorts. That was one of the goals of, of the, uh, the design of the monument. So he was looking for experimental con uh, confirmation of, of his ideas, but wasn't able really to get it to work properly. The idea of using the monument as a telescope also turned out to be a problem because it didn't have quite enough precision to do the measurements on the stars that he wanted to. So it was a kind of a great frustration in a lot of ways for him. So what ended up being the, the historical consequence in a sense was that although Hook had been very influential and I'll go through a little bit of a history in a moment. During that century, during the end of the 17th century, historically, he was a non-person until sometime in the 20th century, when people gradually became aware of his contributions. And depending on which books you look at, Hooke is remembered, if you're a physics student, for Hooke's law, which relates to springs, for his contribution to Boyle's law, which relates to the volume of gases, He's not recognized for his work on barometers or a lot of other interesting issues in capillary action. Um, if you go into a biology textbook, Hooke is recognized as the person who saw cells and didn't understand what they were. It's kind of a, a sad commentary. And as I say, it's only recently that a full set of his uh, breadth has become more available. So I thought I'd try and make a kind of a table, if you will, uh, in which I put together Hooke's major accomplishments, some of the things that he thought about but never quite made it through, and things in which he was really incorrect, okay? And I don't know whether this will be a successful operation or not, but certainly his major accomplishment and the one for which he is really recognized and was recognized both in his lifetime and afterwards was uh, the development of the microscope. And not only the observations, but the technology. You'll see when we talk about from Leeuwenhoek, that it was, among other things, Robert Hooke that eventually confirmed von Leeuwenhoek's observations and demonstrated to the Royal Society that von Leeuwenhoek wasn't just some fantasist from Holland, okay? So clearly his observation about microscopes was critical. His contribution to architecture and city planning were both really significant in terms of his achievements for setting up 
both the structure, some of the structure of London itself, and in building a whole series of buildings that he is now associated with. Many of these are sort of merged in with the work that he did with Christopher Wren, but still worth thinking about. So if we now think now about what he was sort of correct about, but not adopted or not recognized, things like the, he did quite a bit of work on watches. The spring-based, a pocket watch. Um, he developed what is now known as the watch escapement. And he also developed, interestingly enough, the universal joint as a, as a structure for use with the microscopes and things. Um, so all of this was material that he was involved with, but apparently was unable to get full credit for, okay? In a similar sense, he had some of the basic of the laws of motion, which is now, of course, all attributed to Newton. and the phenomena of gravitation for which he was basically correct as far as it went, but he was unable to get full credit for it. And in fact, there was a, a situation in which he was challenged to ask whether his laws of motion could in fact accommodate what was known about the solar system at that time. And the answer is he was not able to because he had not developed the mathematics that Newton had. I mean, remember Newton is responsible for having developed the calculus along with Leibniz. And that's yet another issue of contention, but that's the way it is. He was certainly correct in, a, in an intuitive way in the wave in the area of where he was incorrect. He certainly was incorrect in the origins of color. And actually, he was incorrect in many aspects of planetary okay. But we've also left out of a list like this, the components of his work that led, that were actually sort of remarkable uh, bits of astronomy. in which what he really did was he followed up on a number of other people's work, but he did show the rotation of Mars, of you know, Mars and of Jupiter. And recognized the the red spot of Jupiter. So he, he was actually a much, a, a pretty significant figure if one could put together his entire uh, opus in a reasonable way, okay? Next time we'll talk about von Leeuwenhoek. And when you talk about Leeuwenhoek, once again, you'll hear more about Robert Hooke. I can't help it. It's part of what, what becomes part of his story, okay?